Is that okay, Bobby? Yeah. Here, one more for you. Um, is Paul back there? Paul, do I still have to use this? Oh, man. But you don't. You're okay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first seminar of the spring series, which is great, and we'll welcome our speaker in a second. But I wanted to um, remind you that every week you do have to sign in, um, and that this semester we are trying to utilize student um, uh, interactions with the seminar speakers um, a little bit more. Christine just flew in today from Long Beach, and she's flying right back out. Um, but please, over this semester, uh, try to interact with the speakers as much as you can. Um, so I want to thank the Phycology Lab for for supporting today's seminar. And it's great to introduce to you uh, today is Christine Whitcraft. Um, Christine and I did our PhDs in the same place at different times. I wouldn't say different generations. I, I got out of there just before she did. Um, I was in the Dayton lab. She was down in Lisa Levin's lab and was doing a lot of work down there on salt marshes and restored salt marshes in particular, working with a variety of colleagues that had basically come out of that program. Um, working on a lot of stuff, including basically functional plant ecology and, and invasive species. She then moved on north to San Francisco to the Estuarine Reserve, right? Mm -hmm. Did a postdoc up there before landing um, a position as assistant professor in Department of Biology at Long Beach, which is where she's at now. She is a COAST member. And for those students who, I mean, COAST is a good word in, at Moss Line Marine Labs because they've been giving you guys money. But a lot of that money is also can, can be utilized to visit other faculty and do collaborative work. And so Christine's on that list. Um, and not only that, but she teaches some great classes. So I'm actually going to read off your classes because I don't teach any of these. Even though we're not out of the same pedigree, we're out of the, roughly the same program. She teaches conservation ecology, uh, or conservation biology, sorry, wetland and mangrove ecology, straight ecology, functional plant ecology, marine invasive species, and then she's got a variety of seminars that are on, on a lot of interesting things. Um, classics in ecology. Right now she said she's just now teaching a course on a modern role for natural history, um, which is a, cl a class that they're teaching right now at Case Cal State Long Beach. So it's a pretty diverse program. It's also pretty deep in ecology, which is great. Um, and then I also wanted to point out to you that you'll also see around if you go to WSN, mostly because Christine for many years has been very sweet and runs the student paper award program. So all the judging that goes on at WSN for best student paper, um, she's got a, a colleague and they, they basically work on all that. And this year they did a great job because they produced a contributed paper session at WSN specifically on how to teach natural history in the classroom. So it was pretty cool. And so with that, I'm going to let Christine tell us all about what she does currently at Cal State Long Beach. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Do I have to do anything with that? Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you guys for the opportunity to speak. Um, it was, it's always nice to come up north a little bit. Um, I also had a wonderful tour of some restored areas this afternoon, so I wanted to thank the Phycology Lab for that. I'm going to talk to you guys today about generally the story of restoration ecology in wetlands, which means I'll go back to some work that has been, had been done historically, that I did during my PhD, that then I continue into what we're doing at Long Beach. It's a little bit about lessons learned and a little bit about what we don't know. And you guys can judge which section is larger. <laughs> um, I'm, o I'm partially excited about restoration because while I like the you know, fine scale detail done in the lab, I have super shaky hands and I find that this is sort of better my scale of <laughs> experiments, it's much larger. Um, but restoration ecology in wetlands due to the water, due to the soft soil is not always easy. This is one major and obvious problem um, that construction is hard, but there's many other problems. And so I consider restoration sort of a test of what we know about ecology. Um, I'd like to start off with my acknowledgments, just in case it gets a little busy at the end. I hate to leave off the people who were integral in this work. Um, I have three collaborators from Long Beach, uh, Chris Lowe, Banked Allen, and Jesse Dillon, who we have worked together to evaluate the restoration we're talking about. Uh, my PhD advisor and other people in the lab at Scripps, um, their data is also represented here. Um, we get, uh, in order to do our research, we need permission from field sites. Um, the two field sites I'll talk about today have been really nice about letting us evaluate their marshes. And lastly, none of it's possible without the um, hordes of undergrads and graduate students who like the OCD nature of sorting through samples for small invertebrates. Um, in addition, we had funding from Sea Grant, Cal State Long Beach Startup Funds, and uh, NOAA through one of their restoration pro programs. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about wet, what wetlands used to be. Most of you guys will know this, but it's helpful to remember why we do restoration, and that's why I include it. Um, I also talk a little bit about restoration because it turns out that a word that we as biologists think is just a straightforward definition turns out to be relatively contentious. I went into science because I didn't have to deal with politics. That's so wrong. <laughs> There's politics everywhere. Um, I'll then move into two specific examples where I'm talking about this restoration success and then try and apply to how can we learn this for the, uh, how can we adapt to restoration to learn about the future. So, um, it's a little shocking for people who work in wetlands that a large portion of people don't really care about wetlands. Um, this has historically been true to a larger extent. So for many people, wetlands were horrible places that bred mosquitoes, that caused their farm equipment to be stuck. I'm from the East Coast, and there's a category of freshwater wetlands there that are known as flat wetlands. They're often converted to farm fields. So there was historical incentives under the Swamp Act to convert wetlands to useful ecosystems. Luckily, um, you know, that has turned around, but not before there's been significant amounts of wetland loss throughout the world and uh, throughout the United States. And California leads the charge, if you want to be in that role, with over 90% of our coastal wetlands um, having been lost. A significant portion of the ones that haven't been lost are now in a degraded condition. So in Southern California, we, I was marveling today as we drove around how much open space you guys have. We have much less open space um, and many fewer large wetlands. The areas shown here are from tea sheets that show the historic extent of many of these coastal wetlands. They were dynamic in nature. The opening to the ocean moved around. Um, and they have been significantly reduced down to very small and in some cases non-existent wetlands with over 12,000 acres of total wetland loss in the time period measured. I also don't have to preach to you guys about why they're important, but it does um, speak to that transition of the historical perspective of there being awful places to the modern perspective of something we want to restore. We round that recognize that coastal ecosystems and coastal wetlands have very um, important ecosystem functions, many of them that are mediated by the presence of plants. They can improve water quality, decrease erosion, buffer the land from waves. They're very productive ecosystems for the plants themselves and for the habitat that the area and the plants provide. Some of that habitat is habitat for resident endangered and migratory fauna, from salt marsh bird's beak to the belting savanna sparrow and the light-footed clapper rail. Those are all examples of endangered or threatened species that use our coastal wetlands. In addition, they're nice places to recreate. They're beautiful places to have around you. So for all of those reasons, people want to restore them. So the definition that we have for restoration, and this is just the Society for Restoration Ecology's definition, it's an intentional activity that initiates or accelerates the recovery of an ecosystem with respect to health, integrity, and sustainability which is a relatively understandable definition. Until you start to get into the idea that, well, um, what's recovery? When is an ecosystem successfully restored? When has it recovered? What time point are we trying to go back to? Are we trying to go back to the, a time in wetland history when there were no people? Are we trying to go back to a time maybe in the you know, 60s when it was full of fresh water? Are we trying to go to back to a time in the 90s when it was much saltier? Are we trying to go back to when we let the mouth move all around and we didn't have any homes around it? All of these questions make the question of uh, restoration more complicated. So I always put up the idea, this is my one slide on restoration theory, but just that we have to consider what you're restoring to. The, you know, the idea of restoration is you have some sort of original state that undergoes disturbance. It's now in this disturbed state that we agree we should try and mediate or restore. You remove the disturbance. One goal could be that we return to that pre-disturbance species community and we declare that to be restoration success. The other idea is that we, you have an al alternate state where new species colonize and establish and you have a completely different community. Maybe it performs the same ecosystem functions, maybe it doesn't. So the argument, I make to the students is 
to have a successful restoration, you need to have very clear goals. Once you have very clear goals, it's much easier to evaluate that restoration success. So part of what I'll talk about today is just how do we declare success and how do we set the goals to mean something ecologically? Which means I'll take you down to two sites. We're going first south to Mission Bay in San Diego and then a little further north just south of Cal State Long Beach where I am to Huntington Beach. This is the oldest photograph I could find of Mission Bay. Um, how many of you have been to Mission Bay or to San Diego or SeaWorld? So you guys know what it looks like now. This historic image is already demonstrated some impacts, but you can see this is the opening to the channel. There's already the area where Mission Beach itself is, and you can see there's been some construction into the wetlands. There's a road that crosses it, but for the most part, you can see the sinuous channels and the patterns that look like a marsh. Um, this was the Mission Bay development plan that converted what you just saw into what we know today. It has recreational areas like a sailing bay, um, hotel space, um, airplane um, directional signals, I don't know what you call them, SeaWorld, and a very constrained channel. So within this property, there is a remnant salt marsh in the very back corner, which is known as the Kendall Frost National um, Wildlife Preserve and the Crown Point Mitigation Site. So they're, they're side by side. This is a newly restored marsh. I'll show you, well, not newly. It's a two, it was restored in 2001. Um, contiguous with an existing marsh that had never been restored. And so um, the Levin Lab, before I got there and during my time there, spent a lot of time evaluating how this restoration worked. So this is January um, 1996. I guess I, I even had the date wrong there. Now I'm really dating myself. <laughs> but. Um, this is about a month old. These channels had just been dug. Um, they had let in seawater, and essentially this was what's a passive restoration. So they were gonna let plants and animals recruit to the marsh without seeding anything. Um, through time, you can see that after three years, you have a thick algal cover, some plant cover, but not a lot, and almost six years later, you have an extensive and uh, relatively diverse plant community. So the question was, when or what do we evaluate to look at restoration? The first and obvious metric is to look at plant community. Many of the functions that I uh, talked about in the beginning are mediated by the presence of plants. It's an important structural component. This looks through time from this unvegetated state, um, two years after restoration, or right at restoration when we had no plants, two years, three years, four years, et cetera. And you can see that basically in the beginning with this open bar, you have a lot of open space a low amount of total plant cover, and as you go through time, general ecology, nothing shocking here, the plants grow, overall percent cover increases, and you have um, a larger diversity of plants. With these changes, we decided to look at other metrics that would give us an idea of how function was recovering. One of the functions I'm very interested in is in food web structure. So in order to understand food web structure, we wanted to know a little bit more about actual food, what's there. First thing was to look at detritus, so broken down plant material. This is the um, restored marsh, created marsh in black. This is the natural marsh in red. The general story is if you don't have plants, you don't have much dead plant material. Through time, as you develop plants, you also increase the amount of detritus or plant material that's available to your organisms. When this was published, the numbers did not equal each other between the two marshes. When we reevaluated it just the past year, we found that we had um, equivalent amounts of detritus within the two marshes. In addition, another important food source in marshes is not just the detritus from plants, but the microalgae that grows on the sediment surface. So we did a lot of proxies for, chlor uh, for biomass using chlorophyll A. We did a little bit of taxonomic identification, but we also did um, a proxy in using HPLC, um, high performance liquid chromatography, just to look at the large groups of algae that were present. And each one of these pigments corresponds generally to a group of algae. Um, Fucoxanthin is representative of diatoms, I is, is diadenoxanthin, zeaxanthin is representative of cyanobacteria, and those were two groups that we were really interested in seeing their relative abundance to one another as a food source. So um, this is an experiment done in the same marsh, but generally we found that fucoxanthin, as representative of diatoms, 
was more abundant when you had a lot of lights. In this case, we had an unshaded treatment versus treatments that were heavily shaded. And that cyanobacteria was more abundant in those areas that had more shade. So though this was done through a manipulative experiment, when we looked throughout the marsh, we found that was true. So that meant in terms of the restoration, early on in the restoration, when there was lots of light hitting the surface, we had diatoms on the sediment surface. And as the restoration progressed, we had a balance between diatoms and cyanobacteria. So now we know that you have detritus that increases through time and microalgae that increases through time. Um, the next question was, what's there as that intermediate consumer? What could potentially be using the detritus and the microalgae and then going up to fish and birds as a food source? So we looked at macroinvertebrates. Um, in our world, they're macro. They're captured on a 300 micron sieve, which is relatively small for some people. But they're an important and ubiquitous food source in the salt marsh. Um, I have yet to find a non-ugly way to make these graphs, so I'm sticking with them. But the idea here, you can see just in the changes of the relative proportions of these, it's percent of total macrofauna through time, moving again from this unvegetated condition to the vegetated condition. Initial samples were dominated by insect larvae. They had um, a couple of other groups, but they were um, certainly not an even community. Through time, you can see that the dominance of those insect larvae was reduced as you picked up, uh, up other groups like polychaetes, um, oligochaetes, marine earthworms, and sort of others, which included mites, predatory nemerdians, and other groups like that. So in this system, we argued that you had a shift from insects, which are primarily microalgal consumers, in fact, often some of these specialized on diatoms. As diatoms were abundant, so too were your consumers of diatoms. And as you move through time and it increased the amount of detritus, you increased your detri um, deposit feeders and your det detritivores. So it took a longer time than people might have predicted um, to see a, a community that had developed into something we'd expect in an in a unrestored or a normal salt marsh. Um, and we thought that was indicative of not only structural recovery in terms of the plants, but functional recovery in terms of a food web. So we, well we, me, I graduated having worked on this and thought, I actually know something about restoration ecology. We can predict if we get to a system like this, how we might get to a vegetated system and whether we'd consider that a successful restoration. So with a big jump up to San Francisco, I had continued to work on restoration with this idea that we could make a predictable trajectory up to something that would support charismatic organisms because I, while I love inverts, I know that most people consider them fish food. If Chris Lowe tells me that I'm fish food one more time. Um, so then I came to Cal State Long Beach, and we went down to Huntington Beach, and this was the system that needed to be restored. And this doesn't look anything like the unvegetated system that I thought I knew something about from my PhD work. So I, I thought, well, here we go again. We need to figure out something about restoration and if this is going to, any of the lessons that we learned in one system can be applied to another. So the question was, if this was what we knew, how to go from open mud through a diatom dominated community to insect larvae to plants to a complete suite of invertebrates, and now we're in Huntington Beach where we have plants but no algae and only one type of invertebrate, which I'll come back to, are we going to develop microalgae and a full suite of um, invertebrates, or are we going to end up with a community that, even though it's restored in terms of tidal influence, doesn't have a full functioning food web? These are the three marshes. This is a schematic. This is PCH along the coast. These three marshes were once contiguous. Um, the Santa Ana River flowed into them. Um, the Santa Ana River is now disconnected from the wetlands, <coughs> and roads artificially divide the three wetlands. So we've called them Talbert, Brookhurst, and Magnolia based on the road that runs through them. Um, they were cut off from water by a berm on all sides for almost 100 years, so their only source of fresh water was runoff from the Pacific Coast <coughs> Highway. So by the time we got there, Talbert had been restored in 1989, so we used this as a reference marsh, even though it's not, it's not undisturbed. It's a, just an old restoration. Brookhurst was restored in 2008, and Magnolia was restored in 2009. So we had a chance to look at all the marshes, um, or these two marshes pre-restoration, and compare them to their neighbor. 
This is Talbert in its restored state. This is the new inlet cut to the ocean. Um, these are this, the channels that almost completely drain and the marsh that exists there now. This is Brookhurst pre-restoration. A berm runs all along the side of the flood control channel that didn't let in any sheeting flow. You had a brackish marsh back here. And all of these salt pan areas were once the historic flood channels or marsh channels. So post-restoration, this is what it looked like. There was a series of channels that basically followed what we believed to be the historic channels. Um, and it led in, all the berm was knocked down with the exception of this one section here in the south. It basically let sheeting flow over the marsh as well as um, has channels that never drain. Um, so what we did was start to look at the same metrics that you had seen in the Mission Bay example. This is Talbert between 2008 and 2009, which is um, just measured in terms of chlorophyll A. This is Brookhurst in 2008 and 2009. 2008 was pre-restoration from Brookhurst. 2009 was three months after tidal inundation had been reintroduced to the marsh. What we saw was that um, Talbert, while there's variability from year to year, um, there is a um, fair amount of microalgae there, whereas in Brookhurst, there's a significantly low amount of microalgae when there's no tidal influence. However, within three months, we see that recover to statistically similar amounts of microalgae. So the first worry that we had about the restoration was that microalgae wouldn't come back into the system because it was too shaded. Preliminary HPLC data shows that there is a mix of diatoms and cyanobacteria, so we even have the full suite of what we'd expect um, microalgae composition to be. If you look at invertebrates, same sort of idea. This is 2008, which was pre-restoration for Brookhurst, and 2009, which is post-restoration. Now these are five months after the tidal influence was in reintroduced, and based on percent of total macrofauna, you can see in the beginning, Brookhurst is dominated by this relatively terrestrial isopod, Legia. Um, whereas there's, a much, there's marine earthworms, lots of polychaetes, and mollusks that are in the Talbert community. While we do get shifts from year to year, only five months after that tidal influence was reintroduced, we see that the communities between Talbert and Brookhurst are relatively similar. There were some community differences in terms of relative abundance. Brookhurst was still lacking some of the marine oligochaetes, but that was a much faster recovery than we would have predicted. So if we came back to my idea, the good news was that my PhD hadn't been wasted. I'd actually learned something that could be applied across systems. Um, that this idea, even though we're going from an open, uh, no plant system through a full community, when we tested this in Brookhurst, we found that some of the same rules could apply to restoration where you are getting a microalgal community and it's leading to a full invertebrate community. Which is excellent, but we also wanted to take it to new, um, additionally new function, not just who was there, but more about the food web. So um, with a collaborator, this is um, data from Jesse Dillon's lab, we started to look at, and this is just a course slide to illustrate to you guys, but we started to look at what the microbial community within the system was doing. So everywhere that we had taken an algal sample and an invertebrate sample, we also took a microbial sample. In this slide, we're just looking at the 16S RNA and comparing all the ones in red are from the recently restored and all the ones in blue are from the um, older restoration in Talbert. And based on cluster analysis, we find that you have completely different microbial communities between the two different marshes, both pre-restoration and up to two years post-restoration. So it means while some of the components like invertebrates we saw respond very quickly, we were seeing components that I would have thought would respond the fastest actually still remaining different a couple years later. There's more to come on this when we finish running all the samples. But The other thing was that it was maybe because I'm up here and you guys didn't want to call me out on it, but everyone believed me when I told you that insects were algal feeders and that polychaetes were detritus feeders. We also wanted to look at that from a slightly more mechanistic perspective, and one way to do that is through isotope analysis. Probably many of you are familiar with it, but the idea with isotopes is you are what you eat. That the ratio of heavy to light isotopes within an organism represents the ratio of heavy to light isotopes that they have in their food source. So for example, if you look at what we call a delta C13 ratio, it compares this heavy C13 to um, lighter C13 in your sample relative to that of a standard. So it's a ratio of ratios, and it gives you a number that tells you something about your food sources. 
Luckily, a lot of food sources in the marsh have distinct carbon signatures. Salicornia or pickleweed or sarcocornia is um, distinctive from diatoms based on a signature, which is distinctive from Spartina being a C4 plant, which is distinctive from cyanobacteria. So we can use these as sort of a natural tracer to pull out a little bit about who's eating what. The idea goes something like this, and I wish all my data were this clean, but this is a dual isotope graph that looks at that C13 ratio on the x-axis and the N15 ratio on the y-axis. If we had those three different plant sources that I showed you in the last graph, and something were to change the signature of one of those, any consumer with a shift for processing the carbon, you would expect to follow that food source. So that's what I mean by tracing it. What we did in this case, this is the most coarse analysis that we could do to present it, was I literally took large groups of invertebrates, all the polychaetes, all the oligochaetes, all the predators, and average them to make this graph between, again, this is C13 ratio and N15, average them by marsh. So all these blue dots are the Brookhurst organisms. All of these green dots are the Talbert in organisms and food sources. And what you can see is that they're, st they're statistically different from one another overall as a group, which means that they've had both different food sources available to those consumers and they had some shifts in the actual signature of the food within the marshes. So if indeed the food webs were converging, we would have expected through time these signatures, either by all the food sources being represented within the marsh, available to the organisms, or because the, the ratios became more similar as the marshes had tidal influence, we would expect them to come together. And what we see through time is this is the 2000 and Eight pre-restoration Brookhurst, again, just average. This is 2009 versus Talbert, both years. And you can see that there is convergence overall in the trophic structure. So it supports somewhat what we saw in the structural, structural metrics of just talking about invertebrates, who's there, what food sources are there. And we actually see that represented through the food web, that we have a convergence of this. We have a lot of species level data on the same idea, but you can sort of see the story just from the averaging. So coming back to the point, we have worked out this trajectory, but a lot of restoration metrics focus on what do these provide as food for commercially important or threatened or endangered So this is where collaboration comes into place. We started asking how, where, and why fish were using this newly restored wetland complex. So, the first question is, just like we wanted to ask, was there microalgae, were there microbes, were there invertebrates, we needed to ask, were there fish, and when did they come in? We wanted to know who they were, and because of the nature of t going out and taking a seine, a seine tells you who happened to be in the marsh at that moment. It doesn't necessarily tell you how long they are in the marsh and whether you just happened to capture them on a foray into a new habitat. It doesn't tell you if they're actually using them. So we also tried to um, get at a little bit how habitat was being used and why. Um, so this was a Herculean effort primarily on two graduate students, Erica Fox and Carrie Espasandin's part. Um, they called themselves the Brookhurst Blondes and they claim that they spent 75% of their graduate student life in the marsh. We didn't document it, but I do know that it was a Herculean amount of effort. They did, um, we divided the marshes into two zones, inner, which would be the back of the marsh, lower flow, warmer temperatures, versus outer, which is higher flow, cooler temperatures. Um, and they conducted a series of samples with uh, beach sands at all those locations. Throughout the channel, in the flood control channel, they used a beam trawl to catch the more mobile individuals. And to get at the largest individuals at all these red dots, they did hook and line sampling. Um, this enabled us, while the methods aren't comparable for CPUE, they, are, they do enable us to talk about the different size classes of organisms within the marsh. So overall, the first good news was that if these are the 24 fish species we caught over the period, they are representative of what you would see in a Southern California marsh system. If you start to break it down by other restoration metrics that are used, primarily species richness and diversity, when the um, landowner had applied for a permit, what they're required to report are these metrics, species richness and diversity. So this is species richness up here for year one and year two following restoration. Um, 
over four seasons, and this is um, diversity. And what you can see, Talbert's in the gray color, Brookhurst is in the open color. There are no substantive differences between the two marshes, with the exception of some diversity differences in summer 2010, with um, Brookhurst being lower, and then the reverse in fall 2010, with Brookhurst being higher. So overall, right away, within eight months, they met the restoration metrics of having equivalent species richness and diversity for their fish communities. But with the same data that we used to generate these, we started to ask questions that are of a multivariate nature. So actually looking at not just the total number for the community, but representative numbers of who's there. Because we know that the natural history or the life history characteristics of these individuals are important. So this is um, a CAP analysis which pulls out um, which species drive the variability among communities. So each one of these points on here are the entire fish community caught during one sampling period in that location. The distance between these points represents differences among communities. So for example, this point is most different from this point because they are further apart from one another. The blue dots are inner and outer Brookhurst, the green dots are inner and outer Talbert. We did not find differences between this inner and outer division, though we kept them because that was our experimental structure. Um, we did, however, find significant differences between these communities. And you'll see this both in this figure and the next couple slides. But here, Talbert is dominated by diamond turbot and killifish. Some halibut, though we didn't find that these were the significant drivers. The Brookhurst points, I keep losing my pointer, are dominated by top smell and anchovy. And gobies are just confusing. They didn't help us. So when we started to break this apart, we found that a lot of those species that were abundant within the newly restored Brookhurst were what we would call channel-associated species. So this is average abundance of anchovy, top smelt, and jack smelt. You can see that immediately post-restoration, when we have a habitat that was newly dredged, not many benthic and fauna in the channels, we have an abundance of these um, water column feeders. And it's much higher in Brookhurst than in Talbert. If you look at what I would call marsh-associated species, so killifish, which use um, the marsh itself, the marsh plain itself, for ontogenetic growth, um, the sculpins and the diamond turbot, we had a higher average abundance in most sampling points of each one of those marsh-associated species. And what I'd call cosmopolitan species, gobies, halibut, and pipefish, we had no statistical differences between these points um, across any of the time points. In addition to just presence, we wanted to get at what was the marsh doing for these organisms. We now know that while the metrics of species richness and diversity are equal, the communities are not equal. We also know that potentially they're not providing the same resources. So this is looking at differences in abundance and size across those functional groups. So you'll see repeated here the abundance numbers um, for Talbert and Brookhurst. They show the same thing that I just showed you in the last couple slides, that what we're calling channel associated and marsh associated are different between Brookhurst and Talbert. But in addition, we see that the, the average total length of those fish, the channel associated fish are larger in Brookhurst, where they have a higher abundance, and the um, marsh-associated fish are larger in Talbert, where they also have a higher abundance. So we began again to believe that this is somehow related to the resources that are available to the fish within those marshes. And so while in, by some metrics they're equivalent, by other metrics they are not. So part of the funding that we got was to focus on a commercially valuable species, the California halibut. Um, it is a marsh obligate. Its adults spawn in shallow water near the coast, and then the larvae settle in the shallow coastal environments. Thus why estuaries are in the term nursery habitats. So this is an issue for management because the recreational catch of halibut has um, been increasing while people have seen the commercial catch declining. And um, they're very concerned about the decline in halibut offshore. These are just Department of Fish and Game numbers. So this led to what um, Chris Lowe's lab specializes in, which is finding out where the fish spend time. So for me, who's interested in stable isotopes, the challenge of stable isotopes is that in order to get a good idea of what's going on, you have to sample every food source 
and every um, and a variety of organisms to get over that variability. Well, that's really hard if you don't know where the organisms are spending their time. So combining the idea that through telemetry, and I'll talk about this, we could get an idea of exactly where individuals spent their time also narrowed the data we had to collect on food webs and potential growth rates. Because now we know exactly where to sample. If you can show me where that fish spends its time, that's where I'm going to go sample. So we combine those together to get at this idea that the marshes are not providing even resources to the fish. Again, another graduate student spent a significant amount of time. Um, we would catch via hook and line fishing the largest fish within an estuary and tag them with acoustic tags. You can see the one here. Um, once the fish was tagged and replaced and we noticed no injury, um, an um, army of graduate and undergraduate students would follow it around for 48 hours continuously in a small boat, noting everywhere that it was every five minutes. Um, in the case of halibut, they actually sit there a lot, so we also had to dive down and make sure they were still alive. Um, this is very time intensive. So ultimately, once you've done this for a while, the next step is you'd like to do passive monitoring. Once you have an idea where they spend time, you can set up a series of receivers that are permanent, and they'll record the presence of them so that each time a fish swims within a, a array of receivers, it will triangulate its position, give you its ID number, the date and time that it passed by. But you have to do that active tracking to be able to set up your network of passive tracking. So based on active tracking data, we were able to look at exactly where fish were spending their time. So this is the flood control channel that's actually outside of the marshes, and these blobs are eelgrass patches. These are just two fish data tracks for 48 hours, um, pink and purple. And basically what you can see is that the fish are spending their time actually at that ecotome between the edge of a seagrass patch and the actual shell, hash, and um, sandy areas outside of it. And these big halibut are spending their time out in the flood control channel. They are not spending their time in the small marsh channels. So what we needed to do was look at smaller fish and see if we can figure out what they were doing, because those were the ones we were finding in the marsh channels, not the big ones. So we captured a series of small fish to get at a baseline. This is data that have been published by many people in Southern California or um, all fishes, but just looking at gut tent analysis, and it lines up very well with the literature, that the smallest fish, standard length here, are eating primarily some sort of goo, which is made up of copepods, some fish, and some shrimp. As they get older, there's an ontogenetic shift in their diet until the larger fish are eating primar primarily other fish. In this case, we found a lot of gobies. We also did some stable isotope analysis, and we saw the same shift from extra small fish all the way up to large fish based on stable isotopes. So here we don't have labels because this is a multidimensional scaling plot, which looks at carbon and nitrogen together. Each one of these dots is a carbon and nitrogen signature from a single fish. But what you can see is that there's significant differences in isotopes that line up with what we see from gut contents. So for us, this was just a check that we could use stable isotopes to accurately represent what a fish was eating. Once we found it, we could, what we wanted to do was put these fish into marshes, not let them go anywhere, and see if they grew differently, and see if their diets were different. That would help explain those differences we had seen between growth rates of different species of fish among the marshes. So we placed out cages um, in the marsh channels, um, you'll see from the data set that we ran into um, a series of un, um, unexpected challenges. One, someone stole all our cages once. That was unfortunate. Two, um, we didn't have bottoms on them the first time, and a crab burrowed under them and ate all the fish. Um, and the third time, we almost got it right. But you'll notice there's varying sam fish levels. I offer this as a precursor for the weird data you'll see next. Um, so this is growth rates between the marshes. Magnolia, this was the brand new restoration when we put the fish within here. Um, this was the one, this was the summer where all the cages were stolen but magnolia. But we can see that the fish are not growing within magnolia. The next year when we had these back out, Brookhurst and Talbert, this is a two, three-year-old restoration at this point, and a 22-year-old restoration, they have equivalent growth rates between the marshes. So 
what we're seeing is that new restorations aren't offering the same food resources as the old restorations. When we did isotope numbers on these, we saw the same thing. Magnolia fish had the same isotope signatures as the place we had captured them because they weren't eating when they were in Magnolia, the new restoration. The signatures of Brookhurst and Talbert were um, not different from one another. So the fish caged within those two areas were able to get the similar food resources between the two. So the next question we wanted to ask was we're putting this together as a complete picture of what's going on, was another restoration metric for wetlands would be, are these contributing species to offshore communities or to other regional wetlands along the coast? So in this case, we did an experiment where we looked at two different types of uh, feeders, large fish. We looked at ambush predators. These are your halibut um, and your uh, spotted bay bass. They are waiting, usually in high flow areas, um, in that ecotone that we learned between seagrass. They're striking at prey, and they generally move less. So what another graduate student did was to put tags on these fish, capture them in Huntington Beach, put tags on them, drive them in a car to Bolsa Chica, which is a, uh, just up the road, and release them in Bolsa Chica. The question was, and this was done in reverse, so they were captured in Bolsa Chica, driven to Huntington Beach, and the question was, would they come back? Would they home? Would they return to the spot where they started from? Now, we recognize that this is potential connectivity. Because we're artificially driving them, it's not real connectivity. But it, it demonstrates whether they could potentially move among the marshes. Um, so looking at these two wetlands, you can also see their very different shapes and sizes. So you might expect they wouldn't offer the same resources. But in the case of halibut, we saw about 17% of the halibut home. And they did this in a three days or less. And they did it equally between the two sites. So in some ways, it indicated that even though Huntington Beach was a younger restoration, it was still offering resources that would support the fish. When we did this with um, the spotted bay bass, zero. None of them homed. If you looked at a different group of feeding trophic types, we have foraging predators. Here we're looking at leopard sharks, um, shovel nose, and smooth hounds, gray smooth hounds. They're moving frequently and quickly. We were predicting that these guys would home. Indeed, between the two of them, we saw that we only captured leopard sharks in one location. That's why there's only one arrow. Um, but we saw 80%, 73%, and 83% of these homed, which means that there's a with these restored estuaries, there's a lot of potential connectivity between the two systems. Um, the, the roving foragers home more often, which makes sense. They're generally, they move quicker and more frequently. Um, and they're doing it relatively quickly. So even though this is a newer restoration than Bolsa Chica, it also provided evidence of potentially another metric that we should look at in terms of evaluating success. So if we come back to my argument, you know, what's important about restoration, Part of this is we know that bringing back the water is really important, that having that tidal influence and hydrologic connectivity is essential for restoration. It can often happen very rapidly at some of the levels, like plants, invertebrates, and potentially not the microbial community. But what we're really interested in is not just this rapid recovery of what I'd call structural parameters, but some sort of functional equivalency which we do see return in the fish communities, but only after more time. Which, I mean, this is slightly a self-serving funding plug, but it means that two years of restoration monitoring may not necessarily tell you about the equivalency or the functional um, recovery. Successful restoration can be done in a regional context, as exam examined by the potential connectivity. Um, and we need to incorporate some sort of resilience into there. So I just have a couple of slides at the very end that sort of put forward ideas as to how we might evaluate restoration in the face of all of these potential large-scale changes. One of the large-scale changes is this idea of passive versus active restoration. There's been a lot of mandates by um, resource agencies that restoration happen quickly. One strategy to have restoration happen quickly is to plant plants instead of letting them recruit. Um, some of the landowners that we worked with we, their plan was to put in a monoculture, 100% of the fastest growing plant that they could have, because that would enable them to meet the Department of Fish and Wildlife standard very quickly. 
we begged them not to do it and to let us do an experiment, and they told us if we did it ourselves, they would let us do it. So 5,000 plants later, um, we did an experiment looking at monocultures versus polycultures, attempting to demonstrate them, to them that both could achieve a percent cover goal by the same time frame. What we saw over the sampling period was that the solid dots are monocultures, the open dots are polycultures. Both met the, function, the percent cover goals of 80% within a year. Although the monocultures got there faster, both met the management goals. And obviously, the polycultures had higher species richness, because they were polycultures. Um, and they had a greater habitat complexity, which is the function that we're looking for in terms of restoring fish and birds. Well, not really fish. They don't use plants for the same structure, but for restoring birds. Um, in addition, a lot of the restoration we do is undertaken with our current climate regime in mind. So part of what we're trying to do out there is to alter temperature and precipitation to get at the idea of how will these plantings and how will this restoration um, achieve success potentially under increased temperature and variable precipitation regimes. Sea level rise is also another large threat to these systems. In Southern California particularly, there's nowhere to go. There's no backwards for sediment to accrete because that is someone's home or a flood control channel wall. So we want to know how will particular species, in this case cordgrass or Spartani foliosa, respond to increased inundation. This is a, um, what's called a marsh organ. These are the most inundation, the intermediate levels of inundation and the ambient level. We place that in the channel and we're monitoring microbial communities, invertebrate communities, and plant physiology to look at what specific species and overall communities will do in the face of sea level rise. And that brings us to the end of sort of, I would argue my last three slides are the big unknown because everything I said in the first three slides or the first 70 slides would be dependent on what we know about the last three. But I think it's very important to figure out what restoration metrics will help evaluate this sort of change in the future. So that's all I have for you guys. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer any of them. So Paul, the microphone in the middle is fine, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone have questions for Christine? Uh, I was wondering if you monitored um, I guess the flow rate of the, the channels at different stages we have time to see if as new plants or sediment accumulated if you had slower flows that affected anything. Uh, we did actually we did a lot of flow measurements, particularly with that design I showed to the fish of inner and outer. Um, there, a, there were permanent bloggers in the flood control channel, but they were at a much lower density. Like we had one of the inlets to measure the opening and one sort of just further up the channel, and they were finer scale along the marsh channels. And particularly Brookhurst, which was the longer, more sort of balloon-shaped pattern, um, that system has low flow to begin with. And as it's been colonized by eelgrass, which I didn't have in that slide I showed of where the fish went, there was no eelgrass at that point, the flow has slowed to almost nothing inside those channels. So um, it's a really relevant question because part of what we have also done are transplant experiments within the complex with halibut. So we've taken one from that we catch in the marsh and put it in the flood control channel. We've taken one from the flood control channel and put it in the back of the marsh. And now that there's eelgrass back there, the halibut book out. They cannot get out fast enough. And we think that partially it's related to the flow question that you're asking. It's really clogged with eelgrass back there, so it has the resources, but it doesn't have the flow they want. That's our hypothesis. Was that what you were getting at? Cool. Okay. Well, my question was going to be, what, once these channels have been dredged, is there much evidence of sedimentation filling them back in or erosion? Like, how did the channels change through time after they were Yeah, it's an excellent question. I should really quickly go. Um, you can see it. So, um, Much like Bolsa Chica, much like so many estuaries have been on the coast, there's a huge amount of sand moved along, and a lot of it's brought into the estuary. 
So in the time we've been working there, this has closed twice with huge algal buildup and almost a fish die off in there. I mean, so it seems like in some ways the permanent condition for these is going to be dredging. So they have to dredge them every Yes, yeah, so Bolsa Chica, Bolsa Chica, the plan was to dredge that every five years, they dredge every six months. Um, <laughs> hunting to beach isn't as bad because they're further away from the sand replenishment that they do. So the state and county, I think, I'm not actually sure who's responsible for it, but does a sand replenishment project in just Seal Beach, just north of Bolsa Chica, and I think a lot of that makes it in Bolsa Chica. I'm not sure what to do about it. I mean, they're coming up with a strategy now where collectively the county would own a dredge and it would just continuously rotate it up and down the coast. I mean, the real problem is that we live here, right? I mean, we've no longer let the estuary not move around and constrain it. But it is, it's a huge problem too because this is, we find the halibut hanging out here until it's too sedimented and then we don't anymore. So, does that get it? What you yeah. No, it's a big problem. I mean, you can hold it permanently, but I guess they're kind of cute or something. But. Yeah. So, see, I had two personal ones. Oh. So, the first one was, that was really exciting because I was actually involved at, at first when we, we blew out the Crown Point. And I never got to see that it actually looks like it. Because by the time I had left, it was still just algae, unfortunately, for yeah. everyone else. But for us, it was pretty exciting. It was just algae. <laughs> um, so, that was pretty cool just to see that. I just want to come on that. But keeping with the personal part of it, especially let's just take Kendall Frost Mars, which was your reference, and Crown Point, you keep speaking of what they want. You didn't get to what they want. They want to see structure. They want to see, what do you want? Do you, when you go out there as an ecologist, do you see the equality of the restored and controlled marshes enough for you personally? Or do you see the control marshes to be degraded to the point that why bother? Right. Um, it's an excellent question. I mean, part of the, well, where to start? I mean, part of the, I would say the, we were just talking about this in the other class, part of the role, I would say, of natural history and historical knowledge is that we know where to set the baseline a little. It doesn't necessarily exist, I'd say, for some of the things that we're measuring. Like, I don't think invertebrate communities were measured in the same way. We have data that we could find from John Reich from like the 60s in the area, but I don't think that gives us a good idea of what it was like. So the my first instinct is no, probably Talbert or um, Kendall Frost are not good reference sites, in the sense that Kendall Frost is stuck in the back of there with a highly polluted stream that comes into it and very different circulation. And Talbert, it's just it, the Santa Ana is disconnected from it. It has a flood control channel as its source. But I think it's a realistic, I think it's a realistic metric to shoot for. I may be too pessimistic, but I don't think we're going to get much better. So then the follow-up to that is, what's still missing if it can't be attained? And is that, I mean, I guess part of it is educating those around. These aspects aren't coming back, right? You've, you take a system that has um, simple diversity, low productivity, no longer functions in nursery habitat. You brought it up to a baseline, which is the people learn bad work. It's the state at which the system can deal with everything around it. Right? It's still stressed, but that's just what you got, and it has today's perspective of what recruitment looks like and what flows like. So, but I do think it's really important because I think when, for example, Los Cerritos is being restored, Los Cerritos. When people showed it to me, I was like, that is not a wetland. That is an oil operation with some dirt on it. Um, and I've been out there. I've seen it's wetland. I believe it now. Um, but the plan is going forward as a, um, like a conceptual plan. And what is not included in the conceptual plan is the most extreme, which is that you knock down the levee system, you remove the power plant, and you flood the whole thing, and it would work like it used to. So I think what is important about it is that the extreme restoration option be included, because that would bring it back to closer to what we have. So like in the case of Talbert, it was already done. The Santa Ana walls weren't coming down, and no one should brought it up. But in the case of Los Cerritos, I think it is really good to know what the best case scenario would be. And there's two or three ecologists on the review board, and we all just keep saying, well, what about the option to take down the flood control channels? Because if you don't bring it to the table, then Everyone thinks that they're choosing the best one, and when in fact they're choosing.
They're not taking it. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about restoration in the context of like a changing environment where sea levels are rising, do you think it'd be better in the long run if uh, ecologists can get together and kind of create a less patchwork approach to restoration, sort of consolidate some of these areas? For example, move, and it's going to be very hard to do, but move farmland away and so you're going to have bigger more robust, more complex systems where sand and silt can actually move around and you have to put in the financial resources to dredge it? Yes, I mean, I think that's a good follow-up to what we were talking about before in the sense that I think that should be the, the goal, that we know that there should be <coughs> connectivity among these systems and connection, whether it's, you know, swimming packages of carbon being fish, or whether it's the ability to connect at the back of an estuary, or to have um, you know, upstream connections available for a marsh to move backwards. I mean, I think that regional wetland planning, especially in terms of sea level rise, is almost the way you have to do it, or it's meaningless. Like, if we just plan for Huntington Beach, it's, I would almost call Huntington Beach a lost cause. I mean, there's just nowhere to go. That's a sewage treatment plan. Like you're not gonna, I mean, people are not going, I mean, sort of this is my customer thing, but they're not gonna have sewage running everywhere so that we can move the marsh backwards. But if you consider how you could restore this in the context of there is a regional park along the Santa Ana River, and there's Bolsa Chica just up the way, then there is hope for these wetlands to move backwards. But alone, I, I don't think you could model as well, or you have a criteria of an outlook about it. So I think it's a good question. Yeah. yeah I was just, is that how far back does that sewage treatment plant go? Because it just it strikes me that I have seen and actually lived in an area that used a marsh as its sewage treatment plant, and that would be one way to expand the uh, mm -hmm. wetlands. No, it is a good idea, unless I sound too pessimistic about it. I mean, I do still believe that there are ways to deal with these marshes, and um, in Orange County, they have one of the most progressive. Um, water treatment programs, partially because they use tertiary treatment and beyond to make drinking quality water to fill aquifers, and they're using existing natural and created wetlands to put that water back into. So they've made a system where they can take infrastructure and the wetland and make them the system together. So I do believe that it's possible too. I don't know much about this plant. Um, it's sort of a big triangle that goes about twice this distance backwards. Um, on this side is the Santa Ana River that borders it. So there, I mean, there, I'm sure there are ways. Well, I'm not sure, but I'm sure that someone could think of a way. Is that good where you were? Yeah. So we gotta, we gotta let her catch the plane, but Brent's got one more question. Okay. Do you have nutrient runoff problems, and at what step in the restoration does that affect the most? Is it the algae, or the microbial community, or plant community? It's a good question. One thing that we are lacking in our data set is there hasn't been a ton of nutrient studies in the system. We, I would argue, not knowing the numbers, but that we have a significantly lower nutrient problem than you guys do here, being surrounded by agriculture. Most of our runoff is paved surfaces. So it's a little less nutrient and a little more heavy metals. There's a super fun site just behind the next marsh. Um, so that has been the big contamination worry. The monitoring that has been done is more aimed at that. Um, but that said, we do have relatively vigorous algal blooms. It's primarily olma, but every, well, when it rains, not this year. Um, but we do have, so it is there. It's just we haven't really looked at it. And when this closed, I'm going to circuit that question, we had huge algal blooms, which means it is in the system. Anyone wants to study that? <laughs> All right, let's give uh, Christine our thanks.